good morning and a very warm welcome students and teachers of his schools today we have dr amit roy ex director inter university accelerator center delhi for the fifth lecture of the science series very good morning to dr roy i am dr devesh avasthi dean r and d at university of petroleum and energy studies let me begin with a short introduction short background of the lecture series we at upas initiated a science series consisting of six lectures by renowned scientists of india and abroad especially for school students and teachers in association with institute of physics uk indian physics association and indian association of physics teachers there have been a good response of participation by students and teachers in the lecture series lecture series is giving you a glimpse of different topics and aspects of science challenging problems as well as experimental infrastructures in india and abroad to pursue the career in science the first lecture of the series was on plasma and its application by dr shashank chaturvedi director ipr ahmedabad second lecture was on nano electronics by director iit delhi which revealed a strong connection between physics and engineering and nano electronics third lecture of the series was by professor samit kere former director sn bose center for basic sciences calcutta on wonderful world of materials fourth lecture of the series was by dr archana sharma on unlocking secrets of universe she was from geneva accelerator lab fifth lecture today is by dr amit roy on accelerators in science and society i am thankful to dr amit roy for sparing his valuable time for lectures to the students for the information to the students and teacher there will be quiz at the end of lecture series on 7th august based on the questions from lectures and school level science knowledge two quizzes are planned separately for school students and teachers as well the students and teachers attending the lectures are welcome to participate in the quiz the prizes is sponsored by indian physics association and institute of physics uk will be given to winners now before requesting dr amit roy to deliver his lecture i will give brief introduction about him dr roy completed his masters in physics from delhi university in 1968 and his phd from tata institute of fundamental research mumbai in 1975 where he continued till 1990 as associate professor he spent 2 years at florida state university usa as a post doctoral fellow and he has worked at kvi netherland and argan national laboratory usa as visiting scientist he joined inter university accelerator center formerly known nuclear science center as a senior scientist in 1991 and was its director from 2001 till july 2013 he led the team for building the superconducting linac at iuac and pioneered the development of nibium superconducting cavity for accelerators in india he was dae rajaramanna fellow at variable energy cyclotron center calcutta till may 2017 17 Currently he is guest lecturer at Indian Association of Cultivation Sciences Kolkata His research interests are in nuclear physics accelerator physics and atomic physics He is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences in India and is a recipient of eminent scientist award of the Indian Nuclear Society He has served as member of governing boards and councils of several institutes as a member of many uh, national and international scientific and technical com committee He was president of Indian Cryogenics Council for two terms and chairman of the Asian Committee of Future Accelerators for one term. He enjoys communicating science and has written the great experiment series in the Journal of Science Education Resonance. I myself enjoyed his lectures in schools and workshop for his students. He has always been a favorite of his students because of his lectures. I would like to share that I have been scientist in the accelerator laboratory where he led the team of scientists as director at IUAC. Apart from being 
an accomplished scientist. He is a very simple and kind person, always accessible, accessible to the students. With this brief introduction of Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Amit Roy, now I request uh, Dr. Roy to give his lecture. Over to Dr. Roy. Thank you, Dr. Abasti, for giving me the chance and opportunity to talk to the students and uh, for your kind introduction. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be, uh, to be, be part of this uh, science series uh, lectures uh, because it's a very good uh, attempt for you know, spreading the, science, the knowledge of science and, in, and infusing the students, young students, young minds into to bringing in science because it's a, science has, requires young people I mean, we are all past the past the uh, expiry date for doing good science now, and we like to, you know, it, it's always good to see the young people coming in and pass the baton so that they can carry on further and take the country to higher, greater heights. So uh, the topic that we have chosen today for this lecture is accelerators for science and society. Of course, because this is some very some, some subject, one subject very close to my heart. I have, I have spent about half my career in, in you know with accelerators, working on accelerators, making accelerators, and so on, in different places. So I'd like to share some of these things, uh, some of the things which excited me, excites me about this uh, area of work to these students. So a very good morning to you all, students, uh, wherever you are. I hope you are all uh, in good shape, and uh, and and we'll have a time, good time together in this. So let me share my screen. Um, screen is shared. Yes, yeah. So we start with this uh, lecture, accelerators for science and society. Now, accelerators. What are accelerators? Accelerators are tools for the scientists to study. One one hand, very very. <laughs> And on the other hand, very, very large things as well. As I, I demonstrate that in the second uh, slide, in this, sorry. Yeah, so now you see we have been affected by this, this uh, for the last one and a half years, uh, the whole world has been affected by the pandemic caused by this novel coronavirus. And it has you know, brought, brought everything to, I mean, all our lives have been uh, topsy -turvy, made topsy-turvy, completely changed because of this. I mean, school stu students cannot go to schools, people cannot go to the labs, people cannot move, uh, you cannot visit your uh, relatives, you can't go anywhere, it's because of the virus. Now, the only, only hope that we have is to get a good vaccine for this, against this virus, so that we can be protected. Now, to do that, to generate a good vaccine, we need to know how the coronavirus, what is the structure of the coronavirus in the molecular structure. Now, in determining this molecular structure, which is shown here in this, uh, in, in this, in this point, you can see this here, the structure of the spike protein, a primary spike, spike protein of the coronavirus. Coronavirus is like this, it looks like a spherical thing with so many spikes. You must have seen lots of pictures of coronaviruses in, in televisions and uh, on, the, on your television screens and also in newspapers and so on and other media. And this, the, the top part of it, the spikes has this protein, which is the most important part of the virus with which it attaches to the human cell and then infects us. So to get the vaccine, vaccine was designed for this very specific structure of the protein and this structure is determined using accelerators. This is on the small scale. Of course, accelerators have been done. I will talk to talk about uh, the how accelerators have been used to even go even smaller structures that looking inside the atoms and what is inside the atoms. And on the other hand, on the go to very, very large structures, if you want to know what is going on in the sun, inside the sun, how does the sun get the energy? You know, we are all living the entire life cycle of the in on the earth all the creatures living creatures plants everything everything depends on the energy of the sun you know that we get a very small fraction of the energy of the sun so in the sun tremendous amount of energy is produced how is this energy produced you may have heard that 
there will be some of you may know even that there is nuclear reactions going on inside the core of the sun, in the center of the sun, which produces this, releases this energy, and that's what powers the earth, a small part of it powers the earth. So to understand the sun, you need to have accelerators so that you can understand the nuclear reactions going on. And on the still larger scale, you go to galaxy scales, you can have collisions of neutron stars. You may have heard of it in the recent past that their neutron star collisions have been observed through the gravitational waves in, uh, in, in, the, in the, that to the new instruments. And one of such instruments for detecting gravitational waves is going to be built in India in collaboration with the US team. So that's, that's uh, these are the, again, to understand these neutron star collisions, the, the, the dominant processes that goes on and once the collision happens is, to, is the uh, nuclear reaction that goes on and to understand how these reactions go, how they produce the different elements and so on, we need the accelerators. The accelerators help us understanding the very small and the very large also in the, in the universe. So it spans the entire range of objects. And I'll tell you that in, in this process, lots of things have been developed over the years, lots of accelerators, and we can see the effects also on the direct applications of such accelerators in day-to-day -day life in society, in different fields. So I'll talk about that. So next, let's go to the next slide. So accelerators are, they, what do they do? They increase the energy of particles. So you take a particle, a, a atomic subatomic particle, like say electron or a proton, then you want to energize it. You give it high energy. And how do you do that? The simplest form of accelerating a particle is by using it. You just use a battery to source, for example, across two electrodes, a positive electrode and a negative electrode. So this is the anode, this is the cathode. And you put a voltage V across it through a battery or some other source of, of generating a voltage. Okay. So now you put a charged particle, say electron here in, the, in, this, point, in the, this side, the electrons will then go in this direction towards the positive, positive electrode and you'll get accelerated in this <coughs> voltage, which is applied play, across this. So the energy gained that you get is charge times the voltage, simple. So Q into V. So the high. Now, if you want to get high energy, what do you have to do? You put high voltage. The higher the voltage, the higher will be the energy. The charge of the particle is fixed. So you get, so all the, to get high energy, you need to have a high a source of high voltage. Now, this the high voltage source, the, how to create that is the actual accelerating, the, called the consists of the accelerator, which generates this high voltage and allows the particles to be accelerated, to be energized through this machine. So accelerating voltage, this voltage could be either electrostatic, a fixed voltage, DC voltage, or it could be an AC alternating current, alternating voltage, that is, that we call, call them electromagnetic uh, uh, in the voltage in the, in the form. So it could be in the high, very high frequency region, it could be radio frequency, uh, uh, in the voltage should be oscillating at very high frequency, like uh, millions of times, megahertz range, or even gigahertz, depending on the type of particle you want to accelerate. Well, now all these accelerators are built, how did it all start? So a general schematic of the accelerator is given here. You see, you all in the accelerator, you have this main accelerator is here where they have a high voltage. You generate high voltage by some means, either electrostatic or electromagnetic. And it could be a linear type or a cyclic type of accelerator. Now you have, suppose you have generated by some means, the accelerator, I will tell, I will show you some examples of different types of accelerators that people have built. And we have some of them in India also. And I'll show you the uh, pictures of those which are in India. And uh, you have to then generate a, the, 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 this for the acceleration, you need a charged particle. So it, it could be negatively charged particle or positively charged particle. So the, like electron is a negatively charged particle. The proton is a positively charged particle. Alpha particle is a alpha particle is a positively charged particle, or it could be an ion like a you know carbon ion or a or a oxygen ion positive ions. So you generate that in, you generate a place is called ion source is where you generate these ions. That means you take neutral atoms. Them all are neutral. 
So you start with neutral atoms and then you put them in the ion source, ionize the atoms. So you can have generate electrons or, and positive ions. Now, depending on what you want to accelerate, you generate the, say, let's say you, you want to accelerate electrons and electrons will be taken. You have to put a take generate electrons here and then you take put it and then this accelerator will be such that they are in the right potential, right potential, say, it attracts the electron and push, pushes it further and goes down. Now, after this accelerated the electrons, or if it's a proton, then it's a positively charged particle, then the accelerating voltage will be in the reverse direction. So you just reverse the voltage direction, then your positive ions will get accelerated. But the, but the voltage mechanism could be the same. The generation of the voltage the mechanism is the same. So all you have to do is inverse the polarity. So you accelerate this charged particles to whatever energy you want to study the processes, and you put them, let them come and hit a target where you want to put the stop. This you want to see the real interaction of the particles with the material which is there in this target. And then it, what happens after that? Once it hits, there will be some nuclear reaction taking place. Lots of radiations will be generated. It could be the, 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 the radiation that are emitted by in the reaction could be electrons, could be photons, that is gamma rays, could be protons, could be neutrons, could be alphas, and so on. So for that, you have to put detectors. Special detectors are, gener are there, have been developed to see this detection because we cannot see with our eyes and, and, and we cannot feel this radiation. We cannot see the radiation, we cannot feel the radiation. It is invisible to us, to human beings with our senses. So we have to have special sensory devices, which are the detectors. So you have gamma detector for detector for photon gammas, detectors for charged particles. We can detect electrons, we can detect protons, and so on. Detect neutrons also. So even neutral particles can be detected. So all different types of detectors are put around these targets, around this target to catch the all the radiation emitted coming out of this. And that is how you study the process of the react interaction of these charged particles, high energy particles, with different matter. Now, if I want to study the interaction of, let's say, alpha, part alpha particle, I accelerate the alpha particle, which is I take helium gas here and then ionize it. I produce the positive helium ion, which is an alpha particle, doubly positive charge, alpha particle, then it accelerates it and it hits it's the target. It could be a gold foil or it could be a carbon foil. Then I, if I put a carbon foil, I will be able to see study the reaction between alpha particle and carbon. And if I want to go to gold uh, reaction of gold and alpha particle, then I put a gold foil and so. So the for very first accelerator in that in this format, in this form, was the gas discharge, the cathode ray tube, which was developed in the 1880s and then was used by J.J. Uh, Thompson at Cavendish Laboratory in England uh, to discover the electron. So this is the picture of the of his cathode ray tube where the filament is there, electrons are generated, then it's accelerated to some few volts, and then you have a deflector plate, and then you have a at the end you the tube, it's an evacuated tube, partially evacuated tube, and you have the zinc sulfide screen where the electron goes and gives you a, a light particle, emits light particle. The, it fluoresces. So this is the uh, this is actually the same device has been developed into a cathode ray oscilloscope, also the television tube. The early television tubes were all this, had the same mechanism. And, Kevin, and Thompson's uh, cathode ray tube was on the 30 centimeter long. So it's a small device with which he studied the, which he discovered the electron. Now, but now, of course, bigger and bigger accelerators are built, but it started with the, the, the race to be build accelerator started with Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus. So that in, in around 1911, before that, see, this is, this is uh, Lord, Lord Rutherford, who was a professor at uh, Cambridge. He was working in Cavendish Laboratory. He followed J.J. Uh, Thompson uh, as the director of the lab. And his colleague, this is Hans Geiger, and then he, the Geiger student, uh, Marsden, Ernst Marsden. So these three people, they did this experiment. It is known as the Rutherford experiment. You may, may have, some of you may have read it. 
the what the Rutherford experiment, famous experiment of Rutherford, that he used a source of alpha particle is a 14 uh, 212 uh, polonium, an isotope of polonium, which was given to him by Madame Curie. Madame Curie gave Rutherford uh, this one uh, some amount of polonium uh, to study the alpha particles, uh, and then he used this alpha particle to bombard on a gold foil, and he was expecting that the most of the alpha particles will go through and go in the straight forward direction. And he had a zinc sulfide screen on which, fluorescent screen on which he could see the scintillation lights. So the, of course, the experiment was actually done not by Rutherford himself. The professors, senior professors don't, do, don't put their hands. They, they, they use their, only the students. At that time, of course, this, this student was quite young. Uh, they are not this picture. This is a much later. Uh, he was young. So the young people are the ones who do the actual experiment, hands-on experiment, the more, more exciting things. Uh, so they did the, this thing and they, he was, they were all expecting that this alpha particle will go through in the forward direction. But to their surprise, they found that sometimes this alpha particle will come back at large angles. They scattered at backward angles. And that happened approximately 1 in 10,000 times. So it is very painstaking effort to do this experiment. You know, you have to sit in the, because they had to spear, look at the microscope uh, and the screen because there was nothing else. There was no electronics at those days. There was no, uh, no transistors, nothing. No integrated circuits or, uh, you know, screens like for Florida they, that we have on your smartphones and so on. So they had to really look with a microscope, sit in a dark room for hours together, eight hours together. They couldn't even go out for going to the toilet. Because once you go out, your eyes, pupils will, will uh, again, you know, shrink uh, because of the light, and then you will not be able to uh, observe this small, 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 tiny scintillation light sources on the screen. So they had to sit for eight to ten hours in the dark, room going, up, just sitting there and studying and counting these particles. But they did that, and then they found this thing, and then they could, another folk could understand why this is happening. Because at that time, it was thought that the atoms were there, all filled with positive and negative charges. But then Rutherford found that this could happen, these alpha particles are coming back, only if the positive charge of the atom is concentrated in a very, very small region, about one ten thousandth of the time of the size of the atom. That means atoms, the nucleus sits in the center of the atom, and it is ten, one ten thousandth of the atomic size. So if the atom is, uh, say, expanded into a room, a normal, say, household room, then the, tie, the nucleus would be like a uh, the grain of sand. The rest of it is void. The electrons are moving around in that. So this is, the, this is how Rutherford uh, discovered the nucleus. Now, once he discovered the nucleus, he wanted to study this inside of it. He wanted to see, he said he was interested in knowing what is inside the nucleus. How does it, why is it uh, together and it's such a small uh, spot? inside the atom. So he said in 27, Lord Rutherford said, what we require is an apparatus to give us a potential of the order of 10 million volts. I see no reason why such a requirement cannot be made practical. That was his statement. But why did he want such high voltages? Can any student know, have any idea? If you, if you know that, you can send me, uh, say, you can write it or write the answer on your chat screen. Think about it, that uh, uh, why did he want such a high voltages? So I'll give you a couple of, uh, one minute to do that. And after that, I'll proceed. Well, you have done, none of you have come up with that answer, but anyway, let me, let me say that uh, the energy is required. See, you take the alpha particle, he was taking alpha particle, which is positively charged, and the gold the, the, in the center of the new, which is the nucleus, is also positively charged. So what will happen? Normally, they will start, repel each other. Two positive charges, they repel each other. So there is a repulsion. So now you have to, to go inside the nucleus, you need to overcome that repulsion. 
So you have to just go over this repulsion and you have to give that much energy. So one can calculate what will be the repulsion. You just take the charge of the, of the proton and the charge of the uh, nu uh, nucleus. It's a gold, which is gold is 79 uh, positive charge is there, 79 plus and alpha particle is two plus. So you can calculate the same with using the Coulomb uh, law. You know, all, all of you have studied Coulomb's law. It is the, 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 the potential that you get, then the energy of the repulsion is U charge one charge two into E square, which is the electron charge square divided by the, by the distance between the two objects. So if you have to come close together to the very small size, atomic size itself is about an 10 to minus eight centimeters, 10 to minus 10 meters. And the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller. So it is 10 to minus 13 centimeters or so. So if you want to come close to 30, 10 to minus 13 centimeters, see R is very small. So you need very large energy. So it comes to megavolts, million volts or so, several megavolts. So that is why he wanted the particle, the energy or the potential, the potential to accelerate the ener to energies of 10 million volts. He wanted because to be able to overcome this Coulomb repulsion and go inside the study the nucleus. So once he gave this call, people started. His students also started. Some of his students started working on these uh, various schemes, and many other people started. So this is how the accelerator start got built. And two of his students, John Crockcroft and E.T.S. Walton, they in 1932 succeeded in the uh, in making a, a, volt, a voltage of 400 kilovolts. They reached in this. This is the apparatus. This is the instrument where they reached this 400 volts at this point, and this with a voltage is taken there. And then these voltages, uh, the particles are generated here on the top, and they they are they are they go through a tube, which is an evacuated tube, and then they come down. And get accelerated by to these 400 volts protons in this case, but they used and they here at the end they put a target and they studied this reaction. Uh, they put a lithium seven target, uh, seven uh, is an isotope. The lithium exists in two isotopes, six and seven. So there will be a lithium isotope with the mass seven and then bombarded with this 400 kV protons. And they observed that two alpha particles are created, two helium nuclei are created. This is the very first nuclear reaction studied by human beings on the earth by created by they, they studied the first time this reaction was made was created in the laboratory now such reactions go inside the stars in our sun so this is where you know the the, the comes that you have to, you want to study the processes inside the sun you have to create these particles bombard it and then see what happens how the reaction proceeds. So this is the schematic of the uh, voltage. Uh, it's called a voltage doubler circuit cascade generator. Those in the electronics, it is one of the early uh, lessons in electronics. You, those who are interested can, will be able to look at it and say that you just put a, it's a, it's a, it's a coupling of some capacitors and diodes and you put it in a certain pattern that the voltage gets doubled. So you put an AC voltage and you get the uh, twice the you get DC, DC voltage of you can generate it depending on how many parts of the circuit you can repeat repeat this thing and you can get this increase in the voltage so this is called the cascade concept of greinacher cascade generator and with this this uh, the accelerator was built and several accelerators are built and even today some of this this concept is used in as a first initial stage of the big accelerators in many laboratories even today and uh, just to uh, uh, just for their for their efforts, uh, both Cockroft and Walton got the Nobel Prize, won the Nobel Prize for for generate for discovering this uh, accelerator and making this accelerator. The other this is the DC part electrostatic. Now there are parallel efforts to use the alternating current, alternating fields also. And uh, in in Germany in Aachen, uh, Rolf Widerow. He uh, actually used an idea of icing, uh, and I, in, this is 1927-28. He what he did was that he took a set of tubes, and then you put this RF alternating voltage on these tubes, these metal tubes, hollow metal tubes, 
So in a hollow metal tube, you know, uh, from the Faraday's cage experiment, that inside the metal, hollow metal, metal enclosures, there is no field. So the electric field that will exist between the tubes, like this. Suppose I put it here, uh, this, I connect this, uh, like they, 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 they three electrodes are there. So it's connected in such a way that the, when this side is negative, the field is, say, let's say positive here, electrode, and with respect to that is negative, then 180 degree in phase out of, after 180 degrees, this tube becomes positive. So you have, say, a positive, negative, positive, negative electrode to start with in the RF. Now, you are, as the particle moves and you adjust these lengths of this, of this tube such a way that by the time the particle comes from one end to the other end, the phase of the, the RF voltage has changed by 180 degrees. So when it is at this point, it sees a accelerating field because the positive ion comes out, a proton comes here or it sees this, thing, this attractive field, so it gets accelerated at this point. Then it starts moving in a field-free region. So it just goes with the same velocity. As it comes here at this point, by that time, this electrode has changed to positive and this has become negative. So again, it gets an accelerated kick, acceleration. It comes here, then again, it moves in a field-free region. And it, as it comes to this end, the, the voltage has changed by 180 degrees. So it has gone again, it gets another kick. And so on. So by adding these tubes in alternate uh, ways, you can and generating these and these voltages and adjusting the gaps in such a way that the particle follows the and they are always in phase at the right time. They are, uh, approach the gaps at the right time. They match the, the velocity and the and the phases match. So then it gets accelerated one by one. It just keeps on getting accelerated, and you can generate high voltage. In fact, just aside uh, for this thing, uh, something to learn that Widero, when he, he made this scheme, he went to his uh, supervisor for his PhD and his supervisor said, no, 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 this scheme will not work. Uh, it's too uh, complicated and you are in, a high, in vacuum and high voltage, all this RAF, it will not work. This You will not be able to match the phases and it, this uh, system will not work at all. Uh, so you do some other, take some other problem and solve it. But Vidaru was uh, determined that he wanted to do it. He understood that it can be done. He was very sure and he built it. He built the apparatus in spite of his uh, professor. So, and he got the succeeded in accelerating this uh, potassium ions in the first uh, shot to about 50 kilovolts. And he wrote his thesis and he got his, uh, got his PhD. So a lesson to learn for your young students that if you are convinced about something and you know that you are, your arguments are correct, it doesn't matter you don't have to respect the authority. So you just, if the authority, any opposition, anyone in authority positions tells you, no, it cannot work. But if you are convinced it can work, you should, you must give it a try because you never know. So everybody doesn't know. So you have, a, you have a good idea and you are convinced about it, you must give it a try. The other, the next uh, development was big development came by, by because of this gentleman, uh, Ernest Lawrence in Berkeley, California. In fact, he was a 29 year old man. He just joined the Berkeley University as a uh, assistant professor. And then he was uh, interested. He also uh, knew about Rutherford's call to build accelerators and he was interested in that. And then one day he came to, he came across a paper by Widero, which was in written in German. Now, Lawrence didn't know Germany, German, but then he saw the diagrams which he had that Widero had built in the, put in his, in his paper. That he could see the diagram that the particle is going, as it does that, like I showed here, the tubes were there and then the alternating voltages are there and so on. So he said, ah, this is a great idea. I must I use it to make this thing. Then he had thought about something. He said, you have to put in, you know, high voltage you want to generate, you have to put lots of tubes, one after the other and keep on doing. So it becomes very long. So he thought of a very, very, very clever idea. He said, let me take a RF electrode like this, where I, I accelerate the particle. Then I put it in a magnetic field. I put it in, in between two magnets, this, this RF field. Then what will happen? As the particle gets accelerated, 
in the magnetic field in the perpendicular direction, we will bend it in a circular form. So the particle will keep on going in circles. So you started with this, for example, these two Ds are there. So this voltage is connected to this D-shaped electrode. See this white space, space in between. And this and second D is this. And you put an iron source. The source of ions is put in here through this tube. And it is also inside vacuum. And now the particle comes out here, gets pulled to this electrode. And then it travels in a circular path. As it comes to the gap here, this gap, the voltage has flipped by 180 degrees. So it has, it gets accelerated. As it gets accelerated, it gets larger energy and it moves in a circle of wider radius, larger radius. And it goes in here. As it comes here, it gets a kick again and then it gets, gains further energy. But the magnetic field is there. So it bends it in a larger radius and comes here and then keeps on going like this. So it increases, as it gains energy, it increases in radius. And then finally, when it end, comes to the end of the magnet, then you cannot go any further because it will go and hit the walls. So at that point, you say you take it out tangentially. You, you just give a small deflection and so that it deviates from the circular orbit and it goes out. And then you take it through a vacuum tube wherever you want to your study place, the target, the chamber and chamber where you put your target and you study them. So this particle, this is the weight of, that means you, the same voltage source, one electrode, one set of, one pair of electrode, two Ds, he is able to generate much higher energy by making the particle go in number of circles. So in a modern cyclotron, for example, when he built it, and with his student Livingston, they built this first cyclotron was only four and a half inch in diameter. You can hold it in your palm. And they could accelerate protons to 80 kilovolts with this small accelerator, small cyclotron. He called it the cyclotron because particles are going in a cycle. So this is the cyclotron principle. And with this, and this is the feed through the uh, in a high voltage source and etc. the various connections that he has put in inside the vacuum chamber. And this was done by Lawrence and Livingston. This is the first one. And Lawrence won the Nobel Prize in 1939 for devising this the cyclotron. Because after that, he went on to build lots of cyclotrons of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger sizes. And the last one he built was, uh, was accelerating protons to 350 million electron volts. It's a 184 inch cyclotron at Berkeley, uh, where he, Lawrence was the head of this Berkeley lab. And that lab has been renamed uh, in honor to honor Lawrence as the Lawrence Berkeley lab today. So a similar cyclotrons are there in, the, in our country. There is in, v, in the variable energy cyclotron center in Kolkata, we have a, a big accelerator, big cyclotron, which is 88 inch diameter. The diameter is 88 inch, about more than seven feet diameter. And particles are accelerated. And these particles are coming out of this thing. And then they, a magnet can uh, are, uh, direct this, these particles to different, different uh, areas through these vacuum tubes. And they can do the, people can do experiments. So one can set one experiment and do on the, and on, while doing the experiment, the other pe person, another person can set up their experiment, their two chambers and so on. And uh, you see the, at the cyclotron center, they have also built uh, a, another one, which is using superconducting magnet. So it's called a superconducting cyclotron. And this uh, can uh, accelerate, this one can accelerate particles to 100 MeV, and this can accelerate particles to five, 600 MeV or so, mega electron volts for doing nuclear physics studies. This is in Kolkata. Now we have uh, the other, uh, the, the, the electrostatic field, electrostatic accelerators went further. Uh, and this uh, by the <laughs> 1931 by Robert Van de Graaff, he generated the called the Van de Graaff uh, accelerator, where it's a charging system, instead of the doubling system of the of cascade generator, which Dr. Walter did, they used a charging belt system. So you have insulating belt running from ground to the this terminal potential high voltage potential so it keeps on running at a reasonably high speed and you throw charges here at the bottom and you collect charges here so slowly the charge is built up it's like a charging a capacitor so it's a so you voltage that you reach is the the voltage is equal given by the capacitor and the capacitance and the charge that you put in Okay, Q equal to CV, charge is CV. So you get the voltages 
QYC, the charge that you have put in, divided by the capacitance. So with this, you can, you can generate potentials of the order of 15, 20 megavolts inside the in vacuum. And it could be a, 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 either a, in, the early, in the early versions, it's all a, a insulated belt which is running. Uh, and then uh, in, the more, in the later versions, they, they, another thing came up where there are still pellets linked with insulators, a, a pellet chain, which is runs. And that, that device gave the name of this uh, machine to Pelletron. And there are two Pelletrons in the country. One is at Inter-University Accelerator Center in Delhi, where I, I, I was uh, involved in this, uh, I was in, associated with this center. And Dr. Avasti also was, was a scientist here or working with these machines. And uh, the other Pelletron is in the, at, uh, at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in, in Mumbai. So I, I spent my half, first half of my career, I spent with the, here at this point, at this institute. So, uh, so this is the, these are the electrostatic accelerators. Uh, this is the kind of end of the electrostatic accelerators. You cannot go very much beyond 15, 20 megavolts, maybe 25 at the most, uh, because you cannot sustain that Direct, direct, directly, the DC high voltage, steady high, stationary high voltage of such a high voltage in, in, a, in any atmosphere. In, even for this, you cannot put it in air. You have to put in very special gases at high pressure so that you can hold this voltage. Uh, the other type of linear accelerator types, which, you, uh, which I showed you, with the, which was developed by the concept was given by uh, Widero. That also had got modified into number of uh, different uh, versions with different types of accelerator, different types of accelerating sources, and uh, we have two such ac linear accelerators in India. One at again at IUSC and TIF Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So here are these accelerating cavities. This is made of niobium at uh, operating at super, at liquid helium temperatures, so that it becomes superconducting, and so with a very small amount of uh, power. RF power, you can generate very high voltages. And so one after the other, the particle goes through this. this there are tubes inside, and the particle goes through and gets, gets kicks at every, every of this, every point here, and then finally gets energized. So these are the uh, two accelerators of this type in, in India. And now we have the, the other accelerator we have, big accelerator is at uh, Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology Indore, where the cyclotron concept is, is modified somewhat in the sense that instead of the single one magnet, which is big, where you start with the center and then cyclotron, you go on uh, increasing the radius. And because there is a limit finally of the size of the magnet that you can be one single magnet. But this is because this concept avoids that and you can go further and make much bigger accelerators is called the synchrotron principle where you fix the orbit, orbit is fixed. The particle always go around this particular circle. Sorry. Particle, all the particles will go around the same circle. But what you do is, how do you get energy? As you put, put these particles in, the magnetic field here, all these magnets that, that, hold, that bends these particles in this circular track are together ramped up. That means the field is slowly going up as the particle energy keeps going up. Every time the particle goes through a RF field, it gets energized and then the next magnets also get slightly higher value. You increase the current in the magnet. These are all electromagnets. So you increase the current along with the particles as the energy goes up. So this is synchronously energizing the part, the magnets along with the particle energy. So this is, let's see, called the synchrotron principle. That means they are together in time, it's synchronous at the same time. The particle energy goes up, the magnetic field also goes up. So this is how the synchrotron works. And we have a synchrotron in, uh, in, at Raja Ramana Center where electrons are accelerated, this particular ring in this ring, it uh, accelerates electrons to 2.5 giga electron volts. That means 2.5, 10 to the power 9 electron volts is generated. Now, what do we do with this? These synchrotrons have the property, the electrons when they go to very high energy, as they are going, changing the direction, as they change the direction, you know, when they change the direction, there is an acceleration. You know about the centripetal and centrifugal forces. You have learned about that. So whenever changes, moment and the velocity changes direction, that's a, there is a force acting on it. 
and it's there is acceleration or deacceleration so when it's such thing happened the particle will this particle will radiate which is this electrons being light they radiate because the energy is relativistic they are very close to the velocity of light and they can generate radiations and at in copious amounts this is called the synchrotron radiation and this radiation it will be in the could be in the x rays region it could be it could be soft x rays a few electron volts uh, so uh, several hundreds of electron volts or it could even go to depending on the energy of the of these uh, electrons and the magnetic field uh, the how much how fast they are moving and how sharply they bend that that will that will give you the wavelength of the radiation emitted it could go into hard x rays also so these x rays are generated and these x rays are used for many many applications so in the in the in this industry there are uh, some 32 experiments can be performed simultaneously and this is the actual picture of the installation it's a 180 meter uh, circumference uh, goes like this these are the mag magnets you can see blue ones Uh, here and there's pipe through this pipe the electrons are going and they have two rings and one ring it's a 450 mev in the is called the indus one this was built first and then the second ring was built which is 2.5 gv and in fact using this this kind of uh, this this kind of uh, the synchrotron radiation the structure of the coronavirus was determined using the synchrotron radiation in fact not not we not in india not our indus but other synchrotrons abroad in in argon national laboratory there is a again a synchrotron source that was used first time to measure the coronavirus structure and determine that later on other people the many many laboratories all over the world also confirmed that structure through using their synchrotrons and the biggest such synchrotron uh, which is actually the biggest accelerator in the in the world today is at the center for european nuclear research cern and in at geneva in fact it's a 100 it's a 2.26.7 km circumference and it is about 100 meters below the ground and it uh, goes in two countries actually it's a, this side one side is, uh, is switzerland the other side is france so it goes to its under underground there uh, through switzerland and france and experiments are the four experiments are being done, are set up there and our indian participation we india contributed to with actual components of this accelerator uh, sorry india contributed with uh, many components in fact the entire machine 26.7 km stands on jacks very precision jacks which can be adjusted to 50 micron micron micrometer level they were all made by a company in, in india uh, they called the avasarala and in bangalore and this was coordinated by uh, the rr cat team they took the they they were uh, they were uh, coordinating the activities and they supplied all this stuff then the several magnets also were supplied and we we uh, and because of the we could we would supply them they gave us a status observer status in beginning now we are as mem associated member of the cern community and in this experiments also there are called their indian contribution participation and contribution in fact you might might have heard sorry this uh, is jumping around i don't know why let me get back to my slide yeah so this uh, the con the contribution you must have heard that there was a higgs boson that came out in 2012 which is called the called the ultimate particle people are looking for and many indian indian uh, teams from different universities and institutes are involved in the experiments in these two experiments the cms and the At At and the atlas here atlas experiment and cms experiment where they they participated and to this for the discovery of the higgs boson so this is the uh, okay now we go to the what are the so this is the story of the accelerators the how they developed over the over the time uh, and then uh, the subjects that we study in accelerators is are this uh, nuclear and subnuclear physics atomic molecular physics astrophysics why is jumping around oops sorry
Yeah. So we study this uh, material science, biosciences, and all for all the all the very various sciences are there. I will not go into details of all of them because this is a these are very, very uh, each of them will be you know several lectures you require to understand all the how these are done. I will give you only three examples. So two will be from uh, nuclear and subnuclear physics, and one in the from the uh, archaeology geosciences in that in that archaeology and environment. So how do we why is why it is important to look at the substance, the structure of the of subatomic structure. This is I I like to tell you about that. That this is we can take snapshots of the system. Now when you when you observe anything, you want to take a photograph or find out what is inside. What the most one of the important things is the resolution of the system. Like for example, in the microscope, you want to see small objects. You need to know the resolution of the microscope. Now what does it depend on? It depends on the wavelength of the particle. The smaller the wavelength, the smaller, the higher will better will be the resolution. You'll be able to resolve things close together, closer together, if you can use a smaller and smaller and smaller wavelengths, right? So beyond a point, light is the light wavelength. We know the our visible light wavelength is, is, is only about 400 between 450 nanometers to about 800 nanometers. So you cannot see, you can see, cannot see the structure of objects. Smaller than this size, so you want to see the smaller sizes. You want to go to higher energy or smaller wavelength photons. For example, you can take X-rays. X-rays will give you it can it can it can give you pictures of the atoms because X-rays of the wavelength is of the order of the atomic size. So you can give that. Now, if you want to go inside the nucleus, this ten thousand times smaller. So you generate the wavelength of the ten thousand times smaller. Now. There is no known way of generating photons of that type. But we can use the principle which Louis de Broglie, he, uh, this gentleman who is uh, shown here, his picture is shown here, uh, he then found out in 1929, he gave a postulated that every particle has a wave associated with it. It's called the wave particle duality. It's one of the idea, the basic ideas in quantum mechanics. So, I don't think you have uh, at this at this level school at the school level you study quantum mechanics, but you will do it in the college level, so you'll know about it. But just suffices to say that every particle has a wave associated with it, depending on its velocity, and that is lambda is the wavelength is given by the Planck's constant h divided by its momentum. Now momentum in a in a in a small velocity you can write as it by two mass, twice the mass and the energy product, square root of that is the momentum, right? P square by 2m equal to energy. So you can get you can see that if you increase the energy E, the lambda wavelength will keep going down. For example, if uh, the energy when you accelerate an electron to one MeV energy, its wavelength is 1.4 10 to the minus 13 meters. And when you accelerate the electron to one GeV, that's at nine EV, its wavelength goes down to two into the minus sixteen meters. Of course, the same that two Me formula will not work here because this is a very very high energy electrons and they move close to the velocity of light. So what is called the the Einstein Einstein special theorem relativity will have to be applied, and so you can calculate the uh, the velocities in that in that form on the wavelengths accordingly. So. This is the, but this is the figure that you get. So now you want to, with the, you can see this now, that if I want to study objects of the order of the size of the nucleus, I have to go to several MeV electrons. And then only I'll be able to see inside the nucleus. So that is why we use the high energy machines. And then you do the same Rutherford type of scatter experiment. You throw the high energy electron, bombard it on different uh, nuclei, and you can see the inside of it. And first the nuclear, you just found, that's the nuclear, how the nucleus and protons are arranged. And then if you increase the energy further of the electrons, then you can start seeing inside the protons and what is inside the neutron. And this was, this was found that as this is the, in the cartoon, it is shown here that see from the atom, the first brother Ford around 90 years ago, he discovered the nucleus. And then, uh, then the nucleus was discovered, the inside of it was measured you know, around 1960 or so, the nuclear sizes and insides of it were found in 1960s. So that's why I call it 60 years ago. And then uh, around eight in the late uh, 78 in that region, 70s region, the inside of the protons were found by increasing electrons still further uh, the, uh, to GeV energies. And you can start probing the inside the nucleus 
with the, with the electron, the wavelength, uh, de Broglie wavelength of 10 minus 16 is, uh, uh, meters, you can see inside the proton. And now we know that the protons and neutrons also consist of quarks and something else called gluons. So this is the quarks and the electrons have sizes less than, we don't know if there is anything inside them or not so far, because the energies that we have reached with these accelerators so far can only probe this is the smallest size of 10 minus 16 centimeters or so. So, and that size, the we have not seen so far any further structure of the electron and what the quarks at this level. So we don't know. If we go to still higher energies, we may, we may be surprised. Maybe something is, else is there, but that's for the future. So this is the this is one of the things on the major uh, thrust of the research in sub nuclear and subnuclear physics is finding the structure and this is where it stands today. Now, second thing I would like to draw, tell you about the I, what I pointed out that they saw the stars, uh, what is goes inside the sun and the other stars. So the element synthesis, all the elements that we see, we know of every nucleus, every atom was synthesized in the stars or in the neutron star collisions or even right at the Big Bang, right at the beginning when the universe started and in the present, in this present universe started. We don't know what, what, if anything happened before stayed before that. Nobody knows what happened happened before the Big Bang time. But Big Bang onwards, which is 13.7 billion years ago, this happened. Big Bang, the universe started expanding and started cooling down. And then the particles were created and they started fusing together to produce the high up bigger, heavier and heavier elements. And this process is the, to understand that, so these are at very high energy. Again, to produce these reactions, you need to overcome the Coulomb repulsions. And when you, for that, you need energy. And so you, you to understand the, how the elements are formed properly, you need to know which elements are formed when and at what rate they are formed. So that can be studied by using accelerated particles in the laboratory. This is what we do. In fact, all these centers in India, this kind of studies are going on and in and other places in the all, all over the world. And we have uh, people are collaborating, they do always collaborate and because all facilities, any, any single place, single laboratory cannot have all the facilities of all the types of detectors, all the types of accelerators. So we go to different laboratories to do different aspects of the studies. But the opportunities exist to do things in India as well as in collaboration with the foreign labs because we are partners. Now, the, all these things that we have learned today is till now in doing the studies so far in the laboratory that in the sun, 600 million tons of hydrogen is being converted into 596 million tons of helium every second in the sun. And that difference of 4 million tons of mass is converted into energy through the Einstein's formula E equal to mc square. And that is the energy of a small part, a tiny fraction of it comes to the earth. And we are all very grateful to the sun because of that, because we are living because of that. We have to thank, the, thank this nuclear reaction, the fusion process going on for our life. This, this happens in the sun, but the sun has a limitation that it can, certain types of reaction only can go on because of the size and the mass. There are massive stars, much larger than the, the heavier than the sun. And in massive stars, if they, if they greater than five solar masses, what happens at the end of this fusion process, fusion process will stop at certain point where you can get energy by fusing. And that, can, that will stop. This fusion process can be release energy only up to the iron cobalt nuclear region. After that, if you to fuse to try to fuse two iron nucleus to produce something bigger, heavier, heavier element, you cannot succeed because it, it will not it will not happen because by fusion it, by fusion it, the heavier product you have to supply energy. It doesn't generate energy. You have to supply energy to for the to fuse. So it's a what is called in, chemi in chemistry endothermic reaction. The fusion for light elements is exothermic reaction. It produces energy. Whereas for heavy, heavier than iron, if you want to produce, then it becomes endothermal. So you have to supply energy. So you cannot do it. So there are other uh, mechanisms are far there. And these heavier elements are formed in neutron stars where they 
collide with very high energies and there are other part processes that come up and produce the entire set of uh, heavy elements up to uranium. What happens to the, sub, uh, the elements which are not, which uh, in the, in like the sun, what will happen? In the sun, what will happen? The hydrogen will get converted into helium. Then the, there will be no further, at that, at that point, the, there will be energy will be reduced and the sun will now try to collapse. And then the gravitational energy will then convert it into heat further and it will go to the much higher temperature. Sun will go inside the core, it will go to much higher temperature. And at higher temperature, then uh, the alpha particles can start fusing and, and start forming the other elements to up to carbon. And then the then the, what will happen? Again, the, that stage is over. Then the, again, this, uh, this, uh, the, there will be no reaction going on. And this, uh, the gravitational gravitational start pulling this thing further and it'll become a little smaller. And the, again, it'll, the inside will heat up. As it heats up, again, the energy inside the uh, particles will go up and then the carbons can fuse into silicon and uh, etc. Magnesium silicon in that region, carbon oxygen will fuse and give you from silicon to sulfur and so on till iron. Once the iron is formed, iron and iron cobalt nuclei, then the, 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 what will happen is that this, uh, uh, this, the, this structure of, this, of the star will be like a onion shell. So you have different rings where the different elements are there. In the center, there will be iron, cobalt, nickel, and the lighter elements will be outside. Now, if it was, if it, for the sun, it will have, what will happen? Nothing further will happen. Sun will slowly then shrink and become a, either a white, a, probably a white dwarf, which is called a white dwarf. I'm not going to change of what white dwarfs are, but it will be just shining like that. It will become very small and then it will remain there. But if the star started with a large mass, more than five solar masses, then this collapse will be so fast, it will start shrinking, it will move so fast, there will be shock wave generated and the, the, the star will explode. And that is called a supernova explosion. And in the supernova explosion, all the <coughs> nuclear, all the nucleus which has been synthesized, elements have been synthesized, will be thrown out in space. And this actual evidence has been found only recently that these heavy elements are produced in this, uh, this, this, uh, this particular picture it <coughs> is of supernova in Cassiopeia constellation in the region, Cassiopeia A. And in fact, this is the, by the Chandra uh, uh, the, uh, observatory, they saw they had, they had measured the, the light, light emitted from this supernova explosion in detail. And they found that different elements <coughs> are here different color differently. And the center is found to be this really iron, coal, nickel, and the lighter elements are found outside this picture. This is the actual measurement. And this is the artist's impression. And in fact, this was uh, historically seen by Tycho Brahe in 1531, 1631, the supernova. And in fact, he had measured, he had seen this star coming up. And suddenly, there was where there was nothing, it just started to become bigger. And uh, he studied this star. Kepler, uh, Tycho Brahe followed by Johannes Kepler. They studied this properties of the supernova. They are recorded. They didn't know that this is a nuclear reaction going on at that time. But they observed it and then luminous light of the thing they recorded. <coughs> so the heavy elements are produced in, in this process during supernova and these heavy elements are thrown out in this space. And then we collect, then the again, this as dispersed in space, they collect, come together from the, this dust, space dust comes together sometime and form a star again. In fact, our sun is not a first generation star in the universe. It has got lots of debris from different supernova explosion and then the star was, the sun was formed. Okay, I, I'm, I, I have to run uh, fast now. Uh, we, we have so far, so found with the help of these accelerators, we now have the story, we can recreate the story from the Big Bang onwards that where some quark gluon, first the quark gluon and plasma comes together to proton and neutron formation. After some time, the light nuclei are formed stars are formed and formation of heavy elements and we come to today. Now, in the very early stages here, also we can study by going to very high energy heavy ions. 
And you can have, say, a very heavy ion. Here it's a picture, actual experimental picture from the detector assembly. And these tracks are each of these tracks are, are actually caused by some radiation emitted debris of these two massive uh, collisions of gold nucleus with the gold nucleus accelerated to sub several GeV. And the temperature in the collision region, you can, you can reach something like 10 to the 12 Kelvin, <coughs> which was there in my, a microsecond after the Big Bang. So really you can go back in time, you know, billions of years back, you can see what was the situation in center, although albeit in a very small, tiny small volume. This, this temperature is there only in the volume of something like 20 minus 20 centimeters square or so. Extremely small volume, but it is there. So you can study those processes. <coughs> <laughs> this was done at Brookhaven National Laboratory in a, in a laboratory, and then also at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, and in both Indian, Indian scientists are involved in these experiments. And you, you have probably, uh, what they claim is that they have seen this stage of this quark gluon plasma also in the laboratory. So a lot of research is going on to find out the properties of that, because that, gives us, that will give us a big understanding of how this process went on in the beginning of the universe. And it'll, it'll go into the astrophysics and cosmology, blend together this knowledge. And now uh, the other, uh, yes, I just said so three examples I'll give. The other is using the accelerators, you can do a carbon-14 dating called accelerator mass spectrometry. And we have a setup at, I, at, Indian, uh, at the Indian University Center in uh, Delhi, uh, the accelerator mass spectrometry setup has been, has been, this has been set up. And we can study, we can study the fields of geosciences, archeology, span biomedicine, oceanography, climate change, atmospheric sciences, forensic sciences, using this kind of uh, dating, this carbon-14 tagging. I'll not go into the details of that. Uh, those who are interested can, can look up and then uh, also can ask questions to the to other others. They, they may be able, will be able to answer some, some of them. And one famous case of the, the dating was done was about in 1991, two hikers in the Alpine ridge between Austria and Italy found a almost in very fully preserved human skeleton. This is found. And then this a small part of it was taken. See, the, the normal carbon-14 dating requires a lot of material, but the accelerator mass spectrometry requires only milligrams of samples. So a small milligram sample was taken from this, uh, this person's body and it was done, carbon dating was done by M, uh, accelerator mass spectrometry. It was found to be 5,300 years old. So it's a, it's from the very uh, the historic and early history time and time, 5,000 years ago. That was the, that was the time of the agricultural uh, era of, of, the, of the human civilization. So a lot of things have been learned about the, of the part person because such as preserved, well-preserved skeleton has not been found before. So with this, all these accelerators that are built and then study the various sciences, basic sciences are there. Now I'll, I'll tell you about how they're used in, in, in the for society, some of the societal applications. In fact, if you, today there are more than 30,000 accelerators in the world, only two to 3% are used for basic research. Rest of it is all for accelerated, for, uh, for applications, societal applications. So why are the accelerators useful? For, for studying this for the society purposes. What properties? The accelerators produce nuclear radiations like the, for the gamma rays or the charged particles and so on. And the properties are these high energy particles have high penetrating power. They can go inside the matter very easily because they're very tiny. You know, they, they are of the, the sizes approximate. I mean, the, the, the area they penetrate is 10 to minus 12 minus 13 centimeters in that sense. So they just can go through between between two atoms in a, in a material easily, no problem. So go penetrating power, they can ionize because they have a lot of energy, they can ionize the, uh, the, the material along the path. And we can, since the energy is, is high and they have, they have characteristic energy, they, uh, this thing, they are extremely sensitive. We can detect them in very small quantities. You don't need large amounts to detect them. Because we, have, we have developed very sensitive detector for such things while doing this basic research. So it's, I, there's a, a, the application in semiconductor industry, it's used for the, making uh, MEM devices, micromechanical uh, devices, 
uh, then uh, in ion beam aperture lithography, you can generate patterns which can be used for ion implantation and making different semiconductor layers for the, you know, today we have this seven layer uh, PCBs or ten, uh, nine layer PCBs. And for that, to do that, I think ion beams are used for generating devices, such things. Medicine, of course, is a very large, big replication of uh, radiation in medicine. And it started along right from the beginning of Lawrence. When Lawrence Barclay, mother of e. Lawrence, uh, Ernest Lawrence, was the first cancer patient who was treated successfully with neutrons produced using accelerated ions from a beam in cyclotron. It happened because Ernest Lawrence's brother, John Lawrence, was a doc medical doctor. So they, they did that. They, as soon as Lawrence you know, made the first cycl the cyclotron, big cyclotron, then in 1939, then uh, they generated neutrons with that, and then it was used. And he, this picture shows a person which is being adjusted for thyroid uh, irradiation at the cyclotron, setting up. Of course, nowadays you can't do that. These kind of things, but there are more, many more safety protocols are there. So uh, the, the, you will not be able to when you go to a, 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 a hospital and get uh, treated by a accelerator. Do not know that the accelerator is there. It will be just a small room with a, a small aperture or something coming in and then uh, irradiating that part. And you can do positron emission tomography. You can generate this, this, this kind of radioactive nuclei, which are actually, it's an <coughs> antimatter. Positron is the antimatter, uh, the opposite particle of, of electron is the anti electron, it's called the positron. It has all properties of the electron except that the charge is positive. And when the positron comes with the close to the electron, it, it, both of them annihilate. And two gamma rays are emitted. And these gamma rays can be, they, they are always emitted in opposite direction. So if you detect one of them and the other, and the other, both of them you can detect, and you can find out where the emission came from. So you can locate the position very well. So this is the location of tumors is done through this technique. So this is called position emission, positron emission tomography. So this tomography is done. And with that, people have found that you can even uh, in the brain is to do a scan, you can find out that which region of the brain which is used for he hearing sound, uh, seeing, uh, reading, and the visual part, and then speaking, etc. Generating words, you can you can locate positions in the brain. And then many uh, pet, pet scans you must have heard about that this is a one of the standard techniques today in hospitals for detecting tumors and other difficult uh, ailments. You can, this is the diagnostics part of it. Now we can do therapy with this. You can use the radiation to cure cancer, to, to break, to, to burn the tumors. And there are a number of, there's a one, uh, one is the electron LINAC uh, used for generating radiation for this thing. This is one at RRMC Kolkata. There are several such LINACs in many, many uh, hospitals all across the country. Almost now, almost all more major uh, uh, hospitals have a small electron LINAC for doing this treatment of tumors. You can do boron neutron cancer therapy. And uh, there's a new uh, kid on the block, as they say, is the heavy ion therapy, uh, which is uh, which was pioneered by a group in Japan and in, in Germany. Uh, they use the iron, heavy ion directly bombarding the tumor. And that's found to be very, very successful, much better than putting x-rays or uh, electrons. So in food preservation, radiation is used. Uh, you can irradiate food with uh, electron beam or, uh, or, X, or X rays generated by electron beam, and then uh, they can be preserved. The bacteria are killed, uh, but the food, there is no uh, degeneration of the, uh, the food. It can be stored for longer period. And so you can transport it much easier. And advantage is that the, this kind of irradiation does not produce radioactivity. It doesn't make it radioactive, so it's safe for consumption. And these are there, there are several uh, food irradiation facilities in our country, in defense lab Jodhpur, in, uh, at Navi Mumbai, Tom, Trombe, Lasangao, and, uh, and in Indore. Uh, there is Indore in the Sabji Mandi, there is, uh, near Sabji Mandi, there is a, a setup which is being, which is just, uh, just started operating and where you can uh, irradiate the various uh, vegetables and stuff, things like that for use. You can do security, you can do cargo inspection system, you can put a, uh, a, extra, a extra beam, strong extra beam generated by linear or electron accelerator, 
and then you can put the x-ray as the as the uh, vehicle uh, suppose the vehicles keep going through a, a tunnel and you put this it, uh, shine this uh, be strong beam of x-rays and you can take a picture and you know what is inside the inside the truck so if there's a cargo going on which is uh, contraband or not we'll find out and if this is not uh, in, uh, you don't have to uh, open the truck or anything and the reason why the accelerators are used is that you do not if you take radioactive source they have to be protected for all time here in the accelerator the advantage is the radiation is gone the moment you switch it off once you switch it off you there is no radiation so only during the uh, when you put it on to take the exposure at that time the radiation is there so at that time you take precaution and then rest of the time it's free it's, there is no other radiation now energy generation is another area which you, uh, you must have heard about the fission is one of the uh, uh, ways of generating uh, new electricity uh, from fission reactors are there which are used for generating electricity and it's one of the cleanest and environmental friendly ways of doing this or uh, generating power you can this this particular uh, uh, bar graph shows the form the carbon dioxide generation from coal from gas from hydro from solar even solar solar and hydro are supposed to be very clean but you see so much of carbon dioxide can be generated not by the process but the making the devices which going to making this hydro and solar power for example in making the solar cells you need the, there is a lot of carbon dioxide generation so wind is there and then you can see that nuclear power nuclear process fission generates the minimum least amount of carbon dioxide and global warming is a much 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 bigger threat to the entire world humanity than anything else, than radioactive waste and radioactive waste also i'll just end with that the radioactive waste also can be there are schemes now people are thinking about using accelerators that is merging an accelerator and a reactor together you can solve this radioactive waste problem to some extent but this is not yet done completely the only the idea exists that it's it's possible to do it but you have to see act in practice put an accelerator and uh, put it in a subcritical reactor and see whether this process works in principle proof of principle has been done but the actual implementation every there are many many projects in the world including in india we have a program of the De Depart department of atomic energy which has taken up this one in china there is another program they are doing following european union is following another program and uh, us also some some program is going on in this direction for this using how to change this waste product how to get rid of the waste product as soon as possible in the fission reaction fission is one point so you it hopefully when it comes up a lot of research is required in that a lot of work is required a lot of work uh, for the young people to do this and to make the fission much much safer than it is even now and uh, we have uh, the other another uh, example of the outcome a, a side uh, by by product of the accelerator research is the world wide web which we are which without which we cannot live today we can't even think of without the world wide web will be all in, you know will be all or lives will be very difficult today because we are so much used to it so this first web server as a picture is shown here as the next cube is called it was devised by tim berners lee at cern in the 1980s to communicate for the for the people because cern is a is a place where scientists from all over the world scientists and engineers from all over the world come and they go back they do something go back they want to be in communication so all the data that is generated they want to share so this world wide web tim berners lee found, found out a way of sharing this thing uh we on the common platform that is that is how the world wide web came to came to be okay so in summary all major advances in understanding of structure of matter have been made using accelerators of higher and higher energies we have new methods and technologies invented for accelerators and they have found wide use we have i have shown you some some of the societal applications but many others which i could not show because there is in this time and we but we still need to invent new technologies for still higher energies because we still do not know the ultimate structure of matter nor what the uh, energy what the what the applications could be even in at higher energies so we need to the it's a exciting challenges for young researchers to get into this field and contribute to both basic research as well as to society
thank you yeah thanks a lot uh, dr amit roy for an interesting lecture on accelerator in science and tech society you very nicely uh, explained different basic principles involved in different type of accelerators and took example of accelerators in chronological order what was the need of increasing energy in a very simple manner you also gave a glimpse of accelerators in india in a complex structure and machineries some typical applications were also briefed and it was interesting to note that accelerators are used to probe object as a small as the corona virus and also used to address the question related to as big things as universe all the areas of science atomic nuclear materials geoscience astrophysics etc are studied by accelerators and very nicely touched upon you including very interesting applications in different areas so this is definitely uh, very very interesting for all the stu uh, students here and uh, i would also like that uh, uh, you personally come to our campus uh, and you see this uh, nice campus at the background of mine and uh, the student here will be very much uh, beneficial to interact with you and uh, I'll, I'll be del i'll be delighted to do that uh, on yeah. the opportunity arises right right yeah and uh, yeah so although i am uh, hearing uh, after pretty long time uh, on these things so i also enjoyed uh, this various aspects and uh, maybe you can pick up some questions from your uh, question box a question q and a and answer some of them and then uh, rest of them uh, actually could be answered by my team ankush uh, saratlar and uh, rajiv uh, and if they don't find the answer they will definitely contact you <laughs> yeah okay uh, let me see if i can get them yeah yes uh, okay let me see Mm. Okay, uh, I think Vikrant Srivastava has asked: uh, the energy is neither created nor destroyed, only converted from one form to another. Then where does it come from? Well, as I showed you, the for the energy when the energy is a particle, it comes from the electric field. So energy that you have, you have put, you have to connect that electric to generate the electric field. You have to put a source of power. Uh, or normal you know electric power which is there <laughs> 250 230 volts so it's coming from that so a small part of the electric that electrical energy is going into the particle that's the answer for that what is the first particle uh, varnit uh, has asked uh, what is the first particle discovered through accelerator that's the one i showed you the jj J. thompson he discovered the electron uh, using that 30 uh, uh, centimeter cathode ray tube that was the first particle elementary particle discovered through using, using an accelerator okay um, then let me see and then you have a question what is the name of the latest accelerator developed okay varnit again asks about that what is the latest accelerator developed and latest accelerator developed so far as i said the last biggest accelerator right now working in the large hadron collider it's a it's a synchrotron principle where it accelerates protons to 7 tera electron volts tera electron volt is 10 to the power 12 electron volts so 7 tera electron volts so there is a, there are two count two proton uh, beams going one going clockwise the other going anti clockwise and they are made to collide at the at different points as i showed four points four specific points they are brought together at that time at in four different points one at a time of course uh, and then then these uh, when they collide they produce whatever the uh, the debris and the the, the reaction products which are studied so uh, so this is the this is the biggest accelerator so far but there are other techniques we have been trying for higher energies there is a, there, there we are also trying in india we are part of the international team there is a, a scheme for doing an international linear collider There is, I mean, our our uh, all the accelerator labs like in IUSC, BRC, RRCAD, VCC, they are all involved in that program. 
and uh, they, they will be trying to make a proper accelerator where 30 kilometer long uh, electron and positron will come and collide against each other. This is the thing which is in the anvil, but it's not, these accelerators cost a lot of money. I mean, several billions of dollars. So it, no country, single country can do afford it anymore. So we have to make consortium of all the countries in the, in the world come together. And so when they come together, there is always, you know, the governments have to support the money, who will do how much and so on. So that those things are going on, still not decided finally, but this is the next step, which one, th we, all the accelerator physicists in the, in the world, they are thinking of going for an international linear collider. Uh, there are schemes, the Chinese have, have also mooted one scheme of making a bigger, large, bigger ring. So they want to uh, build a bigger ring and that's also, people are discussing that. And in and CERN also, they are thinking of a bigger ring. Uh, that is another uh, possibility, larger ring. Uh, which will go to higher energy protons or higher energy uh, things like that. And the most important thing is that other way this this is a this is this is a, so far the conventional way of making accelerators using the actual cavities and things like accelerator structures. Now, what when one uh, the another possibility is using lasers. Uh, this is a very promising field. It's it's uh, it's still in the in the experimental stage in laboratories. That you put a very high power laser, laser, and then focus it. At the focus, you can generate extremely high electric fields of gigavolts per meter. Even 10 to 12 volts per meter, 1000 gigavolts per teravolts per meter can be generated by concentrating a laser power at a very small spot. And so you can generate that. Now the problem is, of course, putting it in a, in a large number of such things together and, and, and putting them in a line to accelerate particles to the desired energy. So those things are to be worked out, but the people have seen some initial star glimpses where you focus the laser, you can you generate high energy particles come out of it, of the of that focus region yeah, on, a, on a, a system. So there are schemes people are working on. In India also, there's some work on this going on in the RRCAT Indore, as well as TIFR uh, Mumbai and the, and the new campus of TIFR at Hyderabad, they are working on these things, uh, a laser, plasma, laser acceleration, laser-based acceleration of particles. And in the world, also all over the country, all over the world, in you, all the advanced nations have they have a schemes of the, trying to work on these things. So that's a, another possibility, which is uh, which can give much much higher energy. Okay. Now let us go to somebody. Uh, Yash Rana asks about dark matter, dark energy, and strange matter. And that is outside my <laughs> range of to topics today. Uh, I, I think uh, we'll. Uh, I, I will skip that because they are already Rajiv Kumar has uh, Rajiv Gupta has Dr. Rajiv Gupta has already um, said something about that. Uh, I think they can go they can go ahead and uh, and do that. So we'll uh, I'll not. So there is one uh, question on uh, how the energy comes from the sun. So I think you mentioned some in your lecture about uh, that hydrogen goes to helium and that. So yeah. That yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. The, 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 for the sun, it is the it is the hydrogen fusion, mainly hydrogen fusion, which is going on in the sun today. And uh, there are there are a number of reactions that goes on. It's not just you know for hydrogen coming together and forming helium. There is a set of reactions. The hydrogen first proton uh, uh, combines to give deuterons. The deuteron and and then and forms tritium proton, and then tritium and deuterium can fuse together to give helium. And this this kind of there are different chains. And uh, Hans Bethe, a, a German physicist who was in America, in U U.S. afterwards, during after the, before Hitler's time, during Hitler's time, he Bethe was Hans Bethe was the first person to give all these reactions to work out the how the detail of the reaction goes on inside the sun and the, how the energy is generated. And each reaction is actually producing energy because yeah, there is each, body, each reaction gives you some amount of energy, and then together today, uh, together you get a certain amount of energy in one. In, on an average, if you had four combine four protons to give alpha particle, you get about something like 25, 26 MeV of energy. And that's how you can calculate total when you four, four million protons get dis destroyed, how much energy will come out. Yes, quarks was discovered through an accelerator. Uh, quarks were discovered through an accelerator. Not directly, quarks cannot be seen, but the quarks effects are seen. That, that quarks are there, we can we know that quarks are there because of the products that they product come out. The, the, uh, the what the quarks generate, they, uh, they, that, that debris of the quarks uh, through that 
that this come there no can they come out of the high energy accelerators and then you can measure them and you work backwards and say that this is the actually because of the quarks this was discovered in in uh, accelerator so uh, even the high energy uh, gurshin kaur asked about uh, the light energy high proton high energy proton beam is invisible to human yes it is invisible to human eye as such uh, but sometimes you know very high energy particle directly are not visible to human eye but there is one effect i must uh, point, point out here for the uh, the people who are who are uh, astronauts or cosmonauts uh, they when they go up in space in space there are some high energy particles when the particle when the high energy particle goes through your eye then directly you don't see it but then in the core in the in the uh, what is called the vitreous humor which is there in the eye the the field the, uh, the eye is filled eyeball is filled with some liquid and in the particle high energy particle goes through this liquid you can generate you can generate flashes of the of them saloon and that flash can be see, can ha, have been observed by astronauts so it's like a detector i actually detector I a nuclear detector in that case but they are very 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 uh, not a normal event so actually there are uh, lots of question i think uh, you have picked yeah. up enough and this uh, uh, rest uh, will take care yeah. and uh, i thank you once again and uh, i will uh, uh, also like to thank the my colleagues panel members uh, dr rajiv dr shatlal and dr ankush which were behind the scene and mr siddharth uh, from the it sector uh, managing the whole thing and uh, students are requested to fill up the uh, the feedback form which is there and uh, so this feedback form uh, siddharth you can uh, display there yes yeah okay and uh, with this uh, i think uh, this is time to close and siddharth maybe you can display that what is our next uh, uh, lecture so next lecture is on 31st and this is on astrophysics by uh, professor annapurni so we'll see you all on uh, thursday at 10 am so have a nice time safe time be healthy be safe so thanks to everyone thank you thank goodbye you. dr roy